The goal of this experiment is to measure the equilibrium constant for the reaction of iron 3 plus with thiocyanate anion to form an iron 3 thiocyanate complex. And to do that, we're going to make use of visible spectroscopy. But in order to make use of spectroscopy, we need to know what the relationship is between the absorbance of the product and its concentration. And that's what we're going to measure with these first five reaction runs in test tubes one through five. Now, in the very first part of the experiment, we prepare a diluted solution of the iron 3 plus, and I've gone ahead and done that here. It has a concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative 4 mole per liter, or as you'll see it labeled on this beaker, that's 0 0.0001 moles per liter of iron 3 plus. So I'm going to go ahead and pour a little bit of, bit of this into this beaker so that we can pipette it. And we're going to vary the amounts of iron 3 plus and thiocyanate in test tubes 1 through 5 so that we can span a range of concentrations when we make these measurements. The other solution we're going to make use of for this part is a fairly concentrated solution of potassium thiocyanate, or KSCN. Here it's a concentration of 0.5 moles per liter. So just by comparing these two numbers, we can see that the concentration of thiocyanate is much, much higher than the concentration of iron 3 plus in this part of the experiment. The last solution we're going to make use of here is a 0.1 mole per liter solution of nitric acid. And this is really just to dilute the reactants and ensure that the, reaction, the reactants and products are relatively stable. So I'm going to start with our diluted solution of iron 3 plus, and we're going to go 1 milliliter into test tube 1, 2 into test tube 2, 3 into test tube 3, etc. Alrighty, we've gone ahead and finished pipetting our iron 3 plus solution, so I'm going to set that pipette aside and that solution aside, as we actually won't need it for the remainder of the experiment. And we can go ahead and pipette our thiocyanate solution actually directly into this first test tube. And so now we're going to move to the 0.5 mole per liter potassium thiocyanate. And for that, we're going to use 5 milliliters in each of the five test tubes. And you'll see these darken up as I add the thiocyanate as the product is formed. Okay, and now finally we're going to add our nitric acid into this solution, that 0.1 molar nitric acid solution, which we're just going to use to dilute the reactants a little bit. And so we're going to add an appropriate amount of nitric acid to ensure that all of these reaction mixtures are 10 milliliters. So we're going to start with 4 in test tube 1, 3 in test tube 2, two in test tube three, so on and so forth. And there we have it. Now if we look at test tubes one through five, unsurprisingly the reaction mixture gets a little bit darker and this is probably difficult to see from your angle, but take my word for it that test tube five is a little bit darker than test tube one. And we're going to start the process of measuring absorbances using the most concentrated solution we've prepared here, which is test tube 5. That had the highest amount of iron 3, you'll recall, and so that's going to have the highest concentration of product in it. So I'm going to pour a little bit of this into a cuvette where I've already blanked the spectrometer, and that involved just taking a spectrum of the solvent, which was water, here. So we've got it in there, made sure to put the clear side in the direction of the arrow, and I'm just going to hit play to obtain a full spectrum of this. Now this is going to record the sp full spectrum of the solution there, which means the absorbance at all wavelengths. Where we're going to focus our attention is on the absorbance at the largest wave, uh, the largest absorbance, sorry, the wavelength of maximum absorbance and its value there, which for us looks to be about 469 nanometers. And so I've gone ahead and selected the wavelength at maximum absorbance, which is 468.6 nanometers. And we can see the absorbance there is about 0.474 for this solution. Now the cool thing about this is once we've done that for test tube 5, we can just set this cuvette aside and repeat the process for test tubes 1 through 4. So now we can go back, for example, to test tube 1 pour a bit of this reaction mixture into a cuvette. It can be a new cuvette or one we've already used. 
and we can see there that the absorbance now is about 0.93. And move to test tube two. That absorbance is about 0.188. 189. So you can see that the absorbance is increasing linearly, which is what we would expect and what we would hope based on Beer's Law. Here's the result for test tube 3, about 278, 280. And here's the result for test tube 4, about 0 0.360362. And just to remind us of that result for test tube 5, it was about 0 0.460. And so we can see roughly a linear increase in absorbance with concentration, and that's what we'd expect based on Beer's Law. We're going to use the results here, including these concentrations, these concentrations of the reactants and the implied concentration of the product, combined with this absorbance data to generate a Beer's Law curve, or a Beer's Law line, that relates absorbance and concentration in the first part of the experiment. All right, now that we've collected our data for the Beer's Law relationship, we can measure absorbances of reaction mixtures where the iron and thiocyanate reactants are present in roughly equal amounts. Again, we're going to vary the initial concentrations of the reactants to see if the equilibrium constant remains the same across these runs. Of course, theoretically, it should. And this will make the reaction mixtures look slightly different. But as we did in the first part, we're just going to measure an absorbance for each of the reaction mixtures. So to begin, we need to prepare our reaction mixtures. And here we're going to be using different concentrations of the reactants. The iron 3 plus will be 0 0.0025 moles per liter. You can actually see that pretty clearly on the reagent bottle here. And that's in the 0.1 molar nitric acid, which we're just using as a solvent here. And now we're going to switch to using the 0 0.0025 moles per liter of potassium thiocyanate. So it's the same concentration as the iron 3 plus solution. Those are going to be present in roughly equal amounts. As we did before, we're going to use 0.1 molar nitric acid as a solvent for the reaction. And so in the first um, five test tubes for the what uh, I call the equilibrium runs, where we're looking for equilibrium constant measurements, we use one milliliter of iron 3 plus solution in test tubes six through 10 here. And then in the last five, 11 through 15, we're going to use two milliliters of that solution. So I'll go ahead and pipette that now. Okay, so we're now done with iron three plus. So I'm going to set that solution aside. And now we're going to move to thiocyanate. The thiocyanate amount is a little bit funky. We're going to go one, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3 and then reset for test tubes 11 through 15. So 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, and 3 milliliters. So we'll go ahead and pipette these now. And here again, the goal of, of varying these concentrations is just to see whether the equilibrium constant remains the same across the runs. That won't mean the absorbance will remain constant. You'll see the absorbance change as we do these. All righty, and now we're done with the thiocyanate solution, so I'm going to set that aside. And remember, our last step now is just to use the nitric acid solvent to dilute each of the reaction mixtures. And the idea here is we're going to bring all the reaction mixtures to the same volume again. This time it's going to be 7 milliliters rather than 10, as we did in the first part of the experiment. So we're going to start by adding 5 milliliters here, 4.5, 4, 3.5, and 3. And then we're going to repeat over here with a slight difference since we use two milliliters of iron three plus solution. We're going to start with four, 3.5, three, 2.5, and two milliliters in each of these.
Okay, and now we're finished preparing our reaction mixtures. And again, this may be a little bit difficult to see from your perspective, but these definitely have different colors indicating different extensive reaction or concentrations of the product in there, right? And that's not surprising considering the fact that we use different concentrations of the reactants in each of these. So now we're going to transfer a little bit of each of these mixtures into a cuvette and again measure the absorbance at our wavelength of maximum absorbance, which is 468.6. So I'm going to start with test tube 6, pouring a little bit into a fresh cuvette here. And we're going to let that absorbance settle, and it's about 0.174. So that gives us a sense of the concentration of the product, right, using the Beer's Law relationship that we'll develop later. Now we're going to move on to reaction mixture 7 and do the exact same thing. Just pour a little bit into a cuvette, pop it into the spectrometer, and look at the absorbance. Here it's about 0 0.291, 0.292, something along those lines. Okay, and on to reaction mixture number eight. Another fresh cuvette, another little pour into the cuvette from the test tube, and we're going to let that absorbance settle, and it's about 0.287 or so for test tube number eight. Now we're going to move on to test tube number nine with yet another fresh cuvette. Pop that in the spectrometer, and the absorbance there is about 0 0.454, 0.455, something along those lines. And finally, we're going to end with test tube 10. Again, pouring a little bit of this into a cuvette, putting that in the spectrometer, and looking at the wavelength at the absorbance maximum, which is about 0.5. 429.432 in this case. Okay, so that's test tubes 6 through 10. And you may have noticed a bit of a pattern of increasing absorbances there, but you know, don't let that fool you. The only reason that happened is because we increased the concentration of thiocyanate across these. We should expect, theoretically, that the equilibrium constant will remain the same across these test tubes. And in fact, the same thing holds for test tubes 11 through 15. So let's start with these. I've got test tube 11, pouring into yet another fresh cuvette, popping this into the spectrometer, and the absorbance there is 0.294. So it's gone down a little bit which, again, is un unsurprising because we kind of reset the concentration of thiocyanate there, we would still expect that equilibrium constant to be the same, or roughly the same, for all of these runs. Now let's move to test tube 12. We'll pop that into the spectrometer, and the absorbance there is about 0.433, 0.434. Now test tube 13. That's about 0 .555, 0 .554, something like that. Two more to go. Test tube 14 is next with yet another fresh cuvette. Gonna pour some reaction mixture in there and pop this in the spectrometer. And while that's settling, another thing I'll mention is that these reactions come to equilibrium very quickly. So if you're worried that the reaction's still going on, there's no need to be. The reaction really hits equilibrium in something like milliseconds. By half a second, it's, it's at equilibrium. So test tube 14, 0 0.641, 0 0.640, something along those lines. And then finally, last but not least, is test tube 15. We're going to pop that in the spectrometer. And this will be our final measurement, and the absorbance of that solution is about 0.78 or so. So, there you have it. We've measured absorbances for all 15 reaction mixtures. The first five, which I took away, for, were for the determination of the relationship between absorbance and concentration of the product complex. And 6 through 15 are going to be used to determine equilibrium constants for this reaction. 
One final thing I'll mention, just in case it's been bugging you. If you've been worried about the fact that this is not zero, when I've taken the cuvette out, don't be. Remember that our blank was for deionized water inside a cuvette, whereas what this is measuring is the absorbent spectrum of the air. So it's not the end of the world if this is non-zero. That's to be expected considering our zero really is deionized water inside a cuvette.